So last week we talked about uh, memory encoding, and we also talked a little bit about uh, short-term memory. So we talked about the uh, working memory model, the modal model, uh, and the week before that we had talked about knowledge structures. So I want to kind of bring both of those together and talk about how people retrieve things from memory. Uh, we're going to make use of some of the earlier concepts on uh, propositional networks and spreading activation. Uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about uh, some false memories and memory errors. So in this lecture, I want to cover first the idea of retrieval from long-term memory. That's uh, the propositional networks and spreading activation networks we talked about. Uh, then I'm going to talk about retrieval from implicit and procedural memories. And then finally, the idea of uh, memory errors. So remember from last week, I made a distinction among uh, different kinds of memory, and I suggested we have explicit conscious memories uh, and implicit uh, types of memories. These explicit memories are things like memory for episodes, memory for specific events, uh, semantic memory for general knowledge, which is not tied to any particular time or place. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you can see we have uh, implicit memories, so procedures, memory for how to do things, uh, priming, uh, which is uh, the, we'll, we'll talk about it, but this is where uh, seeing one thing helps you, uh, you know, changes the way you see something the second time. Uh, perceptual learning, which is uh, learning to read things or see things slightly better because you've been doing them uh, several times in a row. Uh, closely related to priming, but not exactly. So priming deals with this uh, one-time trial, seeing one thing and then seeing another thing. Uh, whereas perceptual learning is built up over multiple exposures. And then finally, classical conditioning. Uh, classical conditioning meaning the association between uh, two stimuli. So let's first talk about retrieval from explicit memories. Let's talk about propositional networks. Um, in the class on knowledge structures, one of the points that I made was that a lot of our knowledge, whether it's semantic knowledge or even episodic knowledge, is stored in a spreading activation network. Now, this doesn't mean that your brain is organized exactly that way, but it means that your memories are organized that way. Uh, so memories for one concept spread to other concepts. This may map on to the way in which clusters of neurons activate other clusters of neurons. So in a propositional network, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, describe a computational or an abstract system that reflects this type of uh, knowledge storage and memory retrieval. Uh, so this might be an, an, an analogy for the way in which uh, the brain works. Uh, this is the way, this is a, a model for how the mind works, and it maps on top of a model for how the brain might work, where uh, a state of activation that represents one concept uh, spreads activation to a state or an cluster of neurons that represents another concept. So keep that in mind. We're not talking about a direct neurological or neuropsychological uh, depiction. We're talking about a cognitive model at a slightly higher level of abstraction. Uh, and the idea here is that thinking and memory relies on manipulation of cognitive symbols. So these are ideas or thoughts or uh, concepts. Knowledge is represented as concepts, which we're going to show on the next slide as nodes in a network, and relations between those nodes. Uh, that's how knowledge is represented. You've got ideas, you've got concepts, and you've got objects, and relationships between those objects, and that's what knowledge is. Uh, these are going to be organized as propositions, and a proposition for our purposes is the smallest unit of meaning that can be either true or false. So the statement, roses are red, is a proposition because we can verify it as a true or false statement. Uh, if you hear roses are red, you know what a rose is, and you know what red is, you can verify whether or not that statement is true or false at any given time. Dogs are mammals. It's another example. So a proposition is the smallest unit of meaning that can be true or false. Roses alone isn't true or false. It's just a concept. Roses are red is a proposition. So how might we represent knowledge in a propositional network? Uh, well, we learn facts, and when we learn facts, we're learning propositions. So dogs chase cats. That's a simple proposition, and you can represent it here as uh, a series of cognitive symbols where there's a dog concept, a chase relationship, and a cat concept, and they're linked together in this simple node showing that dogs, which is the agent, that's the thing that's doing, uh, 
they chase, which is the nature of the relationship between the two, and cat, which is the object. It's a simple statement. It can either be true or false at any given time. And this simple node is connected to other nodes to form a more complicated knowledge network, uh, where we've got uh, somewhere over here is dogs chase cats. Where is it? There it is on the left. So dogs chase cats, that's one. Uh, we've got dogs also chewing bones. That's another one with a different relationship, still connected to dog. Uh, dogs also eat meat. It's a different uh, propositional statement. Uh, dogs and meat are connected in a different way. Uh, and meat comes from bones. So um, bones and meat are related. Uh, bone is a part of, meat is a part of a bone. It doesn't quite sound right, but you get the idea. They're, they're connected in that way. So dog is connected to bones, meat, and cat, but in three different ways. So the same concept. The concept meat is connected to bones and dogs in two different ways. Uh, and you can imagine, of course, this expands uh, to even, you know, other things are chewed, other things are eaten, meat is connected to lots of other things, cats are connected to lots of other things. And you can see how each concept, whether it's cat or dog or bone or meat, can be connected to other things uh, by the nature of that relationship. That's a propositional network. And that seems to be how a really good way to describe how we store a lot of our semantic knowledge. So uh, why is this important? Well, first of all, um, we want to think about how this incorporates general knowledge from specific knowledge. General knowledge in this case would be uh, dogs eat meat or dog is a mammal. That's a relationship that tells you a relation between dogs and meat, the eating relationship, and dogs are animals. That's an is relationship. Dogs are animals, right? That's general knowledge, but of course if you have a dog uh, your dog chases Frisbee. That's a specific piece of information about your dog, shown here on the slide uh, with the word my dog, right? Um, what's important here is that your dog has access to all of the other general dog information by way of a, a specific to general connection. Uh, in this case, the token node, uh, which is your dog, which chases the Frisbee, uh, is linked to the type node, dog is a type, your dog is an example of that type. Uh, and so because your dog is also a dog, you know that it also is an animal and that it also eats meat. And everything that's true about animals that is true of dogs is also true of your dog. And you can see like when we discuss that hierarchical model of concepts, uh, your dog, this token node, is a very, very specific level, uh, a sub subordinate level uh, in that hierarchical structure. So this is a way to put together general knowledge in your memory with specific knowledge in your memory. Well, what about episodes? We said that uh, semantic memory is one form of this declarative explicit memory. And we said that episodic memory, which is events for things that happened to you or that happened in the past, is also part of that. Well, according to this model, uh, this propositional network model, um, episodic memories are, are incorporated in the same way. Here's an example of an episodic memory. Jacob, uh, let's say Jacob is your brother. Uh, Jacob fed, relation, uh, fed pigeons in Trafalgar Square last spring. That's a sentence you can remember. It's a fact you can remember. Uh, that is an episodic memory. You have that memory for that event occurring. Uh, and you can see on the propositional network, uh, the agent is Jacob. Uh, there's a feeding event. Uh, there's a time event when it happened. That might be a very specific episodic memory, something that you remembered. But it also links into uh, the larger semantic memory network of pigeons uh, being in Trafalgar Square. Uh, each one of those might also link into other aspects of your semantic memory. So according to this model, although episodic memory is uh, is a separate construct from uh, semantic memory, they link together. And they have to, right? I mean, everything that you remember in the past, past events, uh, links with things that you know. So you're not remembering past events um, or you know things that happened in the past uh, in a way that's not related to your semantic memory. Uh, if you remember something that happened in Toronto or if you remember something that happened in uh, New York City. You're remembering that event, but you're also remembering general facts about Toronto and general facts about uh, New York City. So the semantic memory and the episodic memory are linked together in that way, and they can be linked together in a propositional network using the same architecture. So um, 
This is a general description for how both kinds of memory are linked together. Memory for episodes, memory for uh, general facts. Uh, there's a, a couple of studies I want to talk about that show how this, uh, how this effect works and how this model works. One of the key things you should notice in this model is that some of these uh, nodes have more relationships, more arrows pointing out of them. Uh, remember the first one that we saw had dog chases cats, dog is an animal, and dogs eat meat. And there were three things connected to dogs. If each one of those is a proposition, each one of those can spread activation. So when you hear something about a dog, uh, the activation from dog spreads to all of those different, uh, all of those other nodes that are connected to dog. If you're trying to remember a specific fact about dog, you need to be able to disentangle that piece of information, dogs chase cats, from the other things that are going to necessarily be activated when the activation spreads from one concept to the other. Uh, in other words, uh, if you have a concept that only has one arrow pointing out of it, it's easy to see that, it's easy to remember that link. If you have a concept with four or five arrows uh, pointing away from it, that means the activation is spreading into four different areas, and you've got to figure out which one of those is the one you need to remember now. That's called a fan effect because memory, uh, the, the activation of that node, fans out in different directions. Let's talk about this fan effect, and that's covered in the textbook as well. So a fan effect suggests uh, that propositions with more links will be harder to remember. Uh, it doesn't mean they're impossible. It just means that it's going to take you a little bit longer to figure out which one is the piece of information you're trying to retrieve. And that's because when you activate a concept, activation spreads out to all of the outgoing links. And many sentences with the same concept can result in poor memory. So if you hear a lot of things that are related, it can, it can get difficult to figure out which one of them uh, was the unique piece of information you're trying to retrieve. Let's look at how this might uh, let's look at how this might uh, play out in a propositional network. Uh, so, in one case, suppose you only have one fact to remember: fact A and fact B, and the link between them. If there's only one fact, there's not going to be any interference. If you can remember, or if you're, uh, you know, if you were trying to remember the link between A and B, and somebody asks you, "What's true about A?" Well. B is the, is the fact that's true about A. There's only one fact about A. Suppose, however, in another situation, you've, rem you've learned lots of facts about concept A. One of them happens to be concept B, but there's lots of other facts. In this case, if somebody says, tell me something about A, uh, how do you know that they're looking for B? Maybe they're looking for one of the other facts. And this is the kind of situation that a lot of us find ourselves in when we're learning new information. So this probably happens in this class, this probably happens in other classes where there's a lot of interrelated information. You've got to keep it all straight. You've learned a lot of things about fact A, and one of them happens to be fact B. If that's the one that's being queried on a multiple choice exam, great. Uh, but if another fact is being queried or being asked about, uh, you may not remember it. Uh, so it doesn't mean you're not going to remember it entirely. It just means that you've got to overcome that negative interference from the other connected nodes. So let's look at situation three. This is, so situation one is one fact, no interference. Situation two is many facts connecting A and B uh, allows for some negative interference, but in a rich propositional network where you have lots of different facts, if you're trying to remember the link between A and B, uh, they're going to also have activation from lots of other things many facts, and a well-connected network, the interference can be beneficial. This is an, an illustration of the levels of processing effect that we talked about last week. Uh, so when you start thinking about the meaning of something you need to learn, you activate lots of areas of your semantic network, lots of different propositions and nodes. So A and B may not have a, the strongest connection, but they can be strengthened by activation from other areas of the network so that A and B are uniquely identified as being the strongest and most activated nodes. So this would be the example uh, of this kind of elaborative processing. You're learning the connection between A and B, but you're also situating A and B within this larger uh, spreading activation propositional network. 
So in a series of studies uh, in the late 1970s and well through the 1980s, John Anderson, uh, who's the author of your textbook, uh, was really interested in this particular type of memory structure. Uh, and for a lot of reasons, one of them being how to figure out human memory, uh, and also how to figure out how different uh, artificial intelligence systems uh, might represent information in a way that's similar uh, to human memory retrieval. Uh, and he identified this fan effect as kind of a key prediction of a spreading activation propositional network. Um, here's one of the original papers. Uh, it, it was originally discovered in the 1970s, uh, and this is an update that sort of suggests how the, this might work. Um, so let's look at his uh, stimuli from his original study. Uh, that's on the next slide. So uh, as you can say, Table 1 says, uh, examples of experimental material in the FAN experiment of J.R. Anderson, 1974. Uh, and you can see these stimuli kind of look like something uh, that's from 1974. So we've got hippies in the park, uh, captains in the church, debutantes in the bank, a uh, fireman in the park, a lawyer in the cave for some reason. So you can see there's a lot of different people uh, in places. And this is one example. Uh, and you can see how this could clearly get a little bit confusing because uh, there's lots of different characters in the park. There's a hippie in the park, there's a captain in the park, and there's a debutante in the park, uh, or sorry, a fireman in the park. Uh, there's different people in the church, and there's hippies all over the place. There's hippies in the park, in the church, and in the bank. Uh, the lawyer, there's only one place where the lawyer is, in the cave, uh, and there's only one thing in the cave, it's the lawyer. So you can see that these things vary by the number of associations. Uh, some things, like hippies, have three different places that they can be. Uh, some places, like parks, have three different kinds of people in them. Uh, so things can have up to three different uh, concepts associated. Uh, and so you can see that some of these things, like hippie, would have more activation fanning out, and park would have more activation fanning in, uh, whereas lawyer and cave is a one-to-one -one connection. So you can see that in the central column, uh, you learn these sentences in this uh, experiment. You learn 26 sentences. Uh, so you, uh, you're exposed to them, you read them, and you try to learn and remember where these different characters are, uh, who's in the park, who's in the cave, where hippies are, where lawyers are, and so on. Uh, then you're given targets, uh, and the targets and the foils are test items. Targets are ones that are true, so you answer yes. Foils are ones that are no but are plausible because they include information that they, you know, they include some of the information that was studied. So they're about hippies and they're about caves and banks and parks. Uh, what's wrong about them is that, uh, well, you can see uh, in one of them a debutant is in the cave. That wasn't a sentence that you studied. Lawyers were in the cave, right? So that's a false answer. That's a one-to-one -one, uh, connection. The number here re means for each of those subject and objects, how many, um, how many fans come out of uh, the hippie concept. There's three. There's hippies in the park, in the church, and in the bank. So that's what that 3-3 three, three means in the target probe. Uh, the second three in the 3-3 three, three target probe, hippie is in the bank example, or, or sorry, hippie is in the park example, means that park also has three uh, lines of activation coming into it. So a 3-3 three, three target means that the subject has three plausible places it can be, and the object has three possible people that could be in it. A 1-2 uh, target means that the debutante in this case uh, can only be one place. There was only one fact you learned about debutante. Bank is a two. There were two facts you learned about banks. Does that seem clear? I hope it does. Um, it's easy to get confused because there's uh, a lot of interconfusion, right? So the targets and the foils, uh, even me looking at it right now, I got to be sure the lawyer was in the park. I have to look back over, was there a lawyer in the park? No, there was not a lawyer in the park. So you can get these straight if you're looking at them. Imagine how difficult this would be if you were trying to say uh, yes or no once you've memorized these sentences. You'd probably get a little confused. And what the fan effect predicts is that it's going to take you longer for concepts that have more activation spreading out from it or spreading in from it. Let's look at the reaction time on Table 2. So on Table 2, um, we've got facts about location on the left-hand column and facts about people uh, in columns. Uh, so rows are fact about location, 
uh, targets and foils. Uh, and the columns one, two, three are facts about people. So your hippie in the park example, the three, three, uh, would be the uh, one in, would be that value 1.36. That's the reaction time, the observed time in seconds that it would take you to say true to an answer that had uh, a person with three facts, like the hippie, uh, that was in a place that had three people in it, like the park. And you can see that that's significantly slower than a 1-1 one, one connection. So cases where there was only one single target uh, and uh, one single, um, so one single fact and one, one single location or one single person are faster to retrieve than things that had three uh, facts about a person and three facts about a location. You see the same pattern in the targets and the foils. So in other words, it takes more time to search through more pieces of information. Uh, and this is the basic fan effect. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's wrong to elaborate. It just means that sometimes it takes you a little bit longer to search through this elaborative uh, system with lots of uh, nodes connected to it. This is kind of a parallel uh, to what we saw in the hierarchical model, where it takes longer to traverse different areas of the hierarchy. Um, okay, so that's that's one of the facts I wanted you to learn about uh, retrieval from uh, declarative uh, explicit memory. Uh, and the textbook goes through others, uh, other examples as well, although it does cover this fan effect uh, in pretty good detail. I want to talk a little bit more about retrieval from other kinds of memory. Uh, so remember, we distinguish between explicit memory, which one way to cover that is that fan effect in those propositional networks, but we also talked about implicit memory. I want to talk briefly about uh, retrieving procedural memories, priming and perceptual learning, uh, and also classical conditioning. Let's start with classical conditioning. Uh, you know what classical conditioning is because you probably learned it in uh, learned about it in your Psych 1000 class. So this is that kind of uh, learning that's um, characterized by learning the association between two stimuli. You see one thing and it predicts something else. Um, the, the example that everybody learns early on uh, is how dogs, for example, uh, Pavlov's dogs, uh, would learn to salivate before food was presented because they knew that the sound of a bell predicted the food coming. And pretty soon it would start to salivate just when it heard the bell. It didn't even need the food there. So it created a link between one stimulus, uh, which was the bell, uh, and another stimulus, which was the food. Uh, and that connection was strong enough that it eventually didn't need the food uh, in order to produce the desired outcome. Um, that's called classical conditioning, and this can be considered a variety of implicit memory. Uh, you see this with notifications, for example. Uh, so any of you who have different kinds of apps, I don't know if anybody still uses Snapchat, they probably don't. Um, there's lots of other newer ways to communicate. Uh, people still use Facebook, um, and even if you don't, you recognize these uh, notification badges as being an indication that there's something there you need to check. Uh, and what most people experience is kind of a uh, generally, either a generally pleasant experience uh, when they see this. You kind of like to get notifications, uh, or maybe a little bit of anxiety because you were, you know, you weren't expecting so many notifications. Something happened. Um, but in either case, what's happening is the association between something neutral, like a number, uh, a number, you know, a white number in a red square, uh, and something else which does produce uh, an effect, which is a connection with a person that you know. Uh, so if, for example, the message uh, or the request from a friend or an activity notification is associated with somebody you know, uh, that's going to be a pleasant outcome for you, usually. Uh, and so what happens is uh, you learn the association between this neutral stimulus, the badge, and the uh, how it predicts the positive experience you're going to have when you see somebody wrote you something. Uh, so much so that you don't even need to see who wrote you uh, to get the positive experience, right? You kind of feel a little, little bit of positive, a little positive feeling when you see just the, the number right there. Most of us are... You know, we find this appealing effect uh, to see these notification badges. That's why a lot of people recommend that uh, turn your notifications off on your phone, right? Uh, maybe you don't want to have to uh, keep seeing all of them there. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, it 
can even cause a little bit of anxiety because it means it kind of signals something you have to do. Now you have to go and check something. So that's a kind of classical conditioning, that good feeling that maybe comes from uh, seeing a notification badge. It's a neutral event, but you remember something. Uh, and although you can't always put that memory or that experience into words, uh, it happens automatically. Um, procedural memories all, also happen automatically. Uh, these enable you to perform uh, learned skills or habitual responses, and it can be really difficult uh, to explain how to do something. Um, so riding a bicycle, you probably, most of you probably learned how to do that when you were much younger. If you tried to teach someone else how to, uh, ride a bike, it would probably be hard to explain it in words, uh, but maybe not so hard to sort of, uh, do it, right? You could do it, um, but you might not be able to explain it very well, uh, using a stick shift while you're driving or tying your shoelaces. So why are these procedural memories an implicit kind of memory? Well, you don't have to consciously remember the steps to do them. Uh, so when I drive somewhere, I don't have to consciously remember the steps for uh, how to turn or how to signal or um, if I'm using a stick shift, which I haven't for decades, but I probably still could uh, if I needed to. Uh, I wouldn't have to remember the steps. I would just be able to do it. Uh, you're those motor memories and those procedural memories are retrieved automatically. For example, try to explain to someone how to tie their shoelaces. Uh, if you've ever tried to teach a young child how to tie their shoes, it can be difficult because you can do it automatically. Uh, you can do it without even thinking about it outside of consciousness. But once you bring those memories and those motor programs back into consciousness, it can be very difficult to put it into words. That's because you're not storing it in terms of words. You're storing it in terms of motor actions. Just the other day, I was trying to teach my younger daughter how to, uh, we were doing some driving practice, and we were talking about the way in which uh, you need to slightly let go of the steering wheel when you come back from a turn. I don't mean let go of the steering wheel completely, but I just mean uh, giving it enough slack so that you can let the car recover without having to be, you know, sort of a jerky type of steering. Um, it's hard to explain that because there's no words uh, that I, I haven't stored it in the form of words or in the store in the form of uh, propositions. I've stored it in the form of uh, remembered motor programs. And so trying to put it into words to explain to someone else can be really difficult. And in fact, if I try to put it into words and follow my own uh, word instructions, I'm probably going to have some problems too. So these procedural memories are not meant to be uh, encoded or retrieved. Uh, by using language. They're meant to be re encoded and retrieved by using, uh, uh, by, by, use, by being in the right situation, by having your hands on the wheel, or by having your hands on the, uh, on the laces that you need to tie, uh, those kinds of things. So classical conditioning, procedural memories. Let's talk about priming, and this is going to cover both uh, perceptual priming and conceptual priming, and a little bit of that procedural uh, tuning or perceptual tuning that we talked about. So priming is an activation of one or more existing memories by some kind of stimulus. Uh, and this happens usually outside of conscious awareness. So the activation does not have to be conscious. Uh, in fact, it's not a conscious decision. It's an automatic activation. Uh, you may be aware that it's happening, uh, but you're not able to control it or stop it from happening. And what happens is that this affects subsequent thoughts and actions. And we're going to talk about two kinds, perceptual priming and conceptual priming. Perceptual priming means being able to perceive things better, getting better at perception because you've experienced a certain word. And uh, conceptual priming uh, means able to activate different concepts or thoughts or ideas uh, because you've been exposed to them. Conce conceptual priming, uh, one clear example, which I think we talked about already, uh, has to do with um, a, a lexical decision task. So a lexical decision task is one where you simply have to uh, decide whether you're seeing a word or a non-word presented on a screen. Uh, and what happens is people get really good at it, right? You can, it's pretty easy to tell whether a string of letters forms a word that you know or it does not form a word that you know. But what we're going to see is that as you're showing people lots of word, non-word, word, non-word non on a screen, uh, if the a word that is seen on one trial is related to a word that is seen in a subsequent trial, 
you're faster to recognize that subsequent word because of the activation that already exists. In other words, it's a prime. Uh, it pre-activates uh, some of that uh, information. And you can think about this within a spreading activation system or a propositional network. Uh, when you hear a word, the activation spreads out, or when you see a word, the activation spreads out to related concepts. If one of those related concepts is then presented, uh, it already has some, inc some elevated activation levels. So it doesn't take as long to activate, which means you can recognize the word more quickly. Let's look at how that might work. Uh, so this is a kind of slide that you see a lot in cognitive psychology. Um, each one of these squares represents a screen uh, display. So imagine that the one on the bottom left, which has a bunch of hashtags on it, that's one screen. And then you press the button, and the screen then shows a word, the word tree. So as you can see, going up, as these squares uh, sort of regress in the upper right hand, those are future trials, whereas the trials on the lower left are current trials. Does that kind of make sense? So you can imagine each one of these being trial one in the lower right, uh, and then we've got trial seven in the upper, sorry, in the lower left, we've got trial seven in the upper right. So you, the first thing you would see is the hashtag. That's a, um, that's a mask to make sure that you, whatever you saw before has been erased from your perceptual memory. And then you see the word tree, and you have to respond with a button as quickly as you can. Yes, that's a word. As soon as you make the response, you see another bunch of hashtags that lets you know to expect some more letters. You then see the letters uh, H T G K O. That's not a word, so you press the no button. You get another set of hashtags. You see the word smile. You say yes, that's a word. And this would go on for possibly hundreds of trials. Each time you're seeing either a word or a non-word, and you're making a decision yes or no. In between all of those words, you see these hashtags to make sure that there's no uh, perceptual memory. Okay, uh, so this is a an, this is an example of a non-related word. There's no relationship between tree and smile. Uh, so, however fast it takes you to recognize um, individual uh, words or non-words, that would be your baseline reaction time. But sometimes uh, the words are connected. Uh, so the word bread for many people should possibly activate the word butter. Uh, there would be pre or po. You know, the activation could go forward. Bread spreads out, but also when you hear the word butter, uh, it's going to connect to that uh, s that spreading activation. The word butter might just be slightly activated because you saw the word bread. Because bread and butter go together conceptually uh, in a script way, put butter on bread, uh, and they go together lexically because they're words that co-occur in the English language. Uh, people talk about bread and butter. Um, if you've seen the word bread, you make the yes decision, and then the next one that comes up is butter, uh, you're going to be faster at making that yes response than you would have on the tree and smile uh, pair that we saw before. So in an experiment like this, there'd be lots of different trials, and we would want to see how fast people are when there are two related words versus two unrelated words. And what research has shown for, well, Hundreds and hundreds of studies have shown uh, this basic effect. People are faster when they are uh, responding to related words that occur one after the other than when they occur or when they uh, react to unrelated words that occur one after the other. And this suggests some degree of spreading activation and conceptual priming. Uh, you can see this kind of conceptual priming also show up in this perceptual learning and perceptual tuning example. So uh, one kind of perceptual learning involves lear uh, learning to read things backwards. Uh, so these don't look like words to you very well. Um, finnick is not a word. Uh, opons is not a word uh, in English. Uh, and so you wouldn't know what these were, but suppose I told you to read them, uh, uh, to, to scramble them, uh, to unscramble them, rather, so that you can form words out of them. And you might notice that the first one is the word uh, knife, right? So if the first one is knife, what's the second one? Opons clearly is spoons. Then we've got fork. Uh, we've got cup, saucer, and plate. And so it should be easier to unscramble the later words than the previous words, because once you realize they're all part of the same general uh, concept of tableware, uh, it gets easier to unscramble them. You've got conceptual information driving some of your perceptual uh, decisions. 
So we've seen an example of conceptual priming. Uh, this is an example of how concepts can influence perceptual learning. In this case, uh, the perceptual learning is getting faster at being able to unscramble uh, these anagrams. Let's look at perceptual priming sort of in a, in a much lower level perceptual uh, fashion. Uh, so perceptual priming, again, priming is prior exposure, enhances the ability to do something, or it changes the ability to do something. In this case, prior exposure enhances the ability to identify a test stimulus based on its physical features. So again, we're going to use word recognition, but in this case, it's not we're not looking to see whether or not can, people can recognize words based on uh, semantic relationships like uh, bread and butter. Uh, we're going to see whether or not people can recognize words based on being physically similar to words that they have seen before. And what's really interesting in this case is that we can show how it's dissociated from explicit memory. What that means is that people can show evidence of perceptual priming even if they have no memory for uh, seeing those words before, or even if their explicit memory is impaired, they can still show an advantage for perceptual priming. And the idea is that uh, these perceptual memories uh, are still active, uh, even if uh, there's, you know, even if you haven't formed new long-term semantic memories, uh, you still may have some residual perceptual activation. Let's look at how this might work. Um, suppose you were asked to identify this word as quickly as possible. Uh, it might not be very easy, right? Uh, this is what's known as a perceptually degraded stimulus. Uh, so if this were to appear on the screen quickly and you were asked to respond as quickly as possible whether or not it's a word or to identify the word, uh, your performance might not be very good because it's not an easily identifiable word. Suppose, though, that uh, five minutes earlier you had seen the word water in exactly this font. And it's important that it has to be in exactly this font because we're talking about uh, perceptual identification. What people, what researchers have found is that you're able to do the identification if you had seen the word water before, a few minutes before. Uh, so not a few days before, but just a few minutes before. Uh, the residual activation for having seen uh, that particular version of the word in the white font, uh, uppercase letters exactly that size, would allow you to identify the degraded word uh, below. Uh, it does not look like the word water, uh, but you would be able to identify it if you had that perceptual priming effect. Let's look at how this has been uh, shown in uh, experimental settings. So here's a, a study by uh, Larry Jacoby uh, in Dallas. Uh, this was done at the U of T uh, a number of years ago. Um, and what they asked their subjects to do was to learn 60 words in those level of processing conditions that we talked about last week. So remember, uh, in the level of processing effect uh, was where subjects had to learn to pay attention either to the structural aspects of the word, uppercase or lowercase, the phonemic aspects of the word, so whether it rhymed with another word, or the semantic aspects of the word, whether or not it fit a particular sentence. And remember we said that your performance was, in, was enhanced when you paid attention to the uh, semantic uh, processing. In other words, people were better when they elaborated on the meaning, uh, but not when they paid attention to the uh, structure of the word. Then, so in this, in this condition, or in this experiment, they ask people to learn these 60 words in one of those three conditions. Uh, so they learned some in a, uh, in some cases they focused on the meaning, in other words they focused on the rhyme, in other uh, uh, words they focused on uppercase, lowercase letter. Uh, then they asked them to recall or demonstrate evidence for recall in two different conditions. One was the standard recognition memory, uh, which would be a replication of what we saw before. And the other was an identification decision, where instead of identifying uh, or remembering the words, they had to identify perceptually degraded versions of words that they had seen and not seen. So kind of like that water uh, example that I showed you on the previous slide. So identification here is not retrieving memories. It's just reading the word uh, and identifying the word that you can see. Uh, and what they predicted was that if you paid attention to the structure, uh, 
you would perform not you wouldn't perform so well on recognition memory than if you paid attention to the meaning. But if you paid attention, if you're doing the identification uh, condition, so if you're just identifying the word, all that matters is that you had seen the word. So whether you paid attention to meaning, rhyme, or letter doesn't matter. All that matters is what, that you encoded the word perceptually. Um, and that's what they found. So here is your level of processing condition for the recognition uh, portion of the study. So when subjects focused on meaning, their performance was better than when they had focused on rhyme and letter. And this is your standard level of processing effect. People are better at being able to recall uh, words when they focus on the meaning. But they found no effect, uh, or no difference, rather, uh, in the priming effect. So priming means how, basically how much faster are you able to identify the word when you had seen it before. Uh, so they're able to identify these words more quickly, having seen them before, regardless of which condition it was in. So level of processing works for explicit memory, but not for implicit memory. Uh, this was shown even more strongly in a variation of this study uh, with what's known as the generation effect. The generation effect means that uh, your memory is improved when you have to generate the answer. So uh, if you have to learn the word cold, for example, uh, in one condition you might be asked to generate the word because it's the opposite of the word hot. So you're asked to generate the antonym. That's an interesting effect because you never actually see the word you have to learn. You just see it in your mind, right? So you don't see it on the screen. You just see the word hot and some question marks. And what you learn is the word cold. And you learn it because you generated it yourself. So you never see it, but you experience it through very deep conceptual processing because you have to think about what's the opposite of hot? The opposite of hot is cold. Then later we're gonna ask you to see if you can remember the word cold. Other conditions would be the context condition, where you see both words on the screen at the same time, hot and cold, and the no context condition, where you see no word and just the word cold. So three conditions. One you generate, one you see the pair, and the other one you just see the word. And what they found was that there was a generation effect like they expected. People were better when they had to generate the word, uh, but they were actually impaired on the implicit memory. Uh, so in other words, they saw, con they, they saw opposite uh, curves. Uh, so you can see the effect was the opposite. For recognition memory, performance is better when you have to generate the answer because it reflects the deeper cognitive processing. For uh, priming, on the other hand, perceptual identification, uh, performance was the worst in that condition. Why? We had never seen it before. Uh, it's kind of, it's very difficult to have a perceptual enhancement effect if you don't actually see anything on the screen. So this suggests that priming, this perceptual priming, can be dissociated pretty well uh, from explicit memory. The final topic I want to cover in this lecture is memory errors. And I'm going to talk about two kinds of memory errors. Simple memory errors for words that you may have thought you saw, uh, and memory errors for uh, uh, for things that were suggested to you, uh, so a suggestibility effect. So on the next slide, now if we were doing this in person, um, if I had been doing the live uh, lecture that I normally do, uh, I would present these to you, and then I would point you to a uh, Google uh, form where you would do a yes, no, I remember the word, I didn't remember the word, and then we would look at the results. Now I can tell you that, um, although we're not going to do it that way, um, the, the we would find these results. This effect nearly almost always works uh, because it's a very robust effect. So I've done this example or this uh, demonstration in class a lot of times, and most people uh, can't determine or can't uh, tell the difference between uh, words that they've seen and words that they haven't seen for the target word. Uh, so let's look at the list. Um, and you may notice something about the list pretty quickly in. Uh, I'm just going to show them at a rate of roughly uh, one per uh, every few seconds. Well, I'm not really timing it very carefully. This isn't a psychology experiment. I'm just going to show them once, uh, like every half a second. Okay, so I showed all of those words to you, and they should have seemed uh, 
related, right? Uh, you probably noticed a theme with those words. Now don't go back and look at them. I realize you probably already have the other slides. Suppose we were to do a recognition task and I were to ask you whether you saw the word bark. Did you see the word bark? Uh, if you were doing this on the Google Sheet or if I were doing this in person and you raised your hand, nobody would raise their hand because nobody saw the word bark. Uh, but if I asked you for bed, you would say yes. Uh, if I asked you for apple, you would probably say no. If I asked you for sleep, you would say yes. If I asked you for rest, you would say yes, and so on. Um, and what we usually find, uh, and this is what uh, the original study found, and this is what we almost always find in class, is uh, here's an example of the words that I would test you with, with the words that you actually saw. You saw the words bed, rest, awake, tired. One of the critical words in there is the word sleep. Um, and what studies have found is that most people falsely recognize the word sleep. That's because sleep is kind of the central tendency of all of these words. Bed and rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze. Those are all sleep words. And what most people realize as they're seeing the list is, hmm, these are mostly sleep words. So you've just experienced the word sleep because it comes to mind when you see these. Spreading activation activates the proposition for sleep. Elaborative encoding means that you think about these as sleep words. So everything that you have, that, you know, everything that comes from the way your memory is organized, the architecture of uh, spreading activation and the architecture of propositional networks is going to guarantee that the word sleep or the concept sleep will be activated in your mind. And so what that means is that when people are asked to do a recognition test later, they often falsely recognize seeing the word sleep. Um, sleep is never presented, but most people think they saw it, uh, and they're kind of almost right. Uh, you didn't see it perceptually, but you did experience it uh, in your mind anyway. Uh, and this is known as the DRM false memory task. Uh, because it's named after three psychologists, uh, Deese, who discovered this in the late 1950s, and uh, Roger Rodiger and Kathleen McDermott, uh, who revisited this task in the 90s and continued to refine it. Um, and what they found is that it doesn't matter what the list is, that we're just using sleep here as an example, there's lots of other themed lists, uh, is that subjects remember seeing the word sleep. Uh, in recognition, a false memory is often as strong as an accurate memory. Uh, and this DRM task can reliably produce false memories of this type. Um, they're false memories based on elaboration. The same thing that helps you remember things because of elaborative encoding also uh, produces false memories of this kind. In other words, humans elaborate and integrate in order to store memories. You've got to create context. Um, but this elaboration can produce errors, and that's what the Dees, Rodiger, McDermott paradigm is all about. Let's talk a little bit more about errors in the next four or five slides. One of the best examples of uh, false memory is the original work that was done well back in the 1970s and 1980s uh, by Elizabeth Loftus. Um, and you've probably heard about some of this. This is called the this is an example of the misinformation effect. Uh, and Loftus was particularly interested uh, with eyewitness testimony because eyewitness te testimony is usually considered to be strong evidence, um, and it certainly was considered to be strong evidence in the legal system in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and she realized that the, because of the way memory works, people can be very um, can be prone to suggestion, right? I mean, uh, if you weren't encoding something with the intention of recalling it later, uh, it's entirely possible that you'll get thrown off uh, by misinformation or by bias or suggestibility. Uh, and so she tested this in a lot of different ways. And this is kind of her classic experiment. You've probably heard about this one before. Um, subjects watched a short film, a short video of a car accident, not a violent car accident, but just two cars hitting each other. Um, and then they were interviewed about what they had seen in the same way that you might imagine uh, somebody interviewing a witness to uh, some other kind of accident or a crime or something like that. So subjects were asked, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? Other subjects were asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? And she used, in this example, five different verbs, collided, smashed, bumped, hit, and contacted. And what you probably notice here is that some of these words are more violent than others. Uh, smashed is a little bit more, viol uh, more violent than contacted. 
One of them seems to be a harsher accident. Uh, so after she asked them uh, how fast were cars going, they provided an estimate. Uh, and what she found, now she's doing it in miles per hour, she's done in the U.S., um, what she found was that when people were asked with the word smashed, they estimated a higher speed than when they were asked with the word bumped, hit, or collided. Uh, something about the word smashed, or sorry, contacted. Something about the word smashed and collided sounded faster than hit and contacted. Uh, and although everybody saw the same video, the smashed asked subjects, people asked with that word, that single word, uh, remembered it in a slightly different way. In other words, they, their error was, their memory was distorted a little bit by the question itself. Everyone had the same information present. Uh, everybody saw the same video. Um, but subjects who were asked with the word smashed remembered something that was a little bit faster. So they remembered a different event. Their memory was changed by the questioning. The, the critical uh, part of this experiment comes a week later when she asked subjects back into the lab and asked them questions about things that they had seen. Uh, for example, here's the target question. Was there any broken glass? And I should point out that in this particular example study, there was no broken glass in the video. Uh, so the cars hit each other, collided, bumped, contacted, or smashed, or whatever, but nobody's windshield was broken and nobody's uh, window was broken. So no broken glass. But people who were originally asked a week ago with the word smashed were more likely to make a false memory than people who were asked with the word hit or people who were given no question at all. So no question just means they weren't asked anything. They were just uh, shown the video and then brought back later a week, a week later and asked if there was broken glass. And you can see hit and no question at all has kind of a baseline false recall of about 12%, but smashed was significantly increased. In other words, being asked a week ago how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other was more likely to generate a false memory for something that didn't even in occur in the original video. Um, people who heard smashed estimated twice as high of a speed, uh, so they kind of distorted their memory, uh, and then they later falsely recalled broken glass. In other words, broken glass. In other words, a piece of information intruded on their original memory, and you can bet that they would. And she followed this up. Uh, that broken glass then becomes part of the memory. It intrudes. Uh, and then it gets re-encoded as part of the original memory, and it becomes very difficult to figure out which one of those was the uh, accurate event. If you tried to convince the subjects uh, later that there was no broken glass, you might not be successful because uh, they had already included that as part of their memory representation. So the suggestibility effect is very strong. Once it's part of your memory, it's part of your memory, and it can become difficult to uh, make it not part of your memory. So let's summarize these memory errors, and that's the end of today's lecture. Um, your memory is far from perfect, and this is a this is a I mean this is clearly a, a a message that's been running through a lot of these lectures on memory. Uh, it's not perfect. It's not designed to be perfect. It's designed to generalize, and it's designed to stretch the truth a little bit so that you can learn new things. Uh, more importantly, some of the processes that aid your memory, like context and uh, elaborative encoding can also lead to those errors. So as you saw in the spreading activation and levels of processing, uh, thinking about what the word means allows you to remember it better, but seeing a bunch of words that are semantically related, which also spreads activation, can lead to errors in that Dees Rodiger and McDermott paradigm. These intrusion errors happen when people remember things that didn't happen at all, and distortion errors happen when people remember a slightly different version of the truth. Okay, so that's it for this uh, week, and that's it for this unit. Um, as you know, we have an exam uh, coming up uh, next week on uh, on Monday. Uh, I'm going to have more to say about the exam later this week. I'll make a separate video, a very short video about the exam. Uh, where I'll talk about what to expect, but it's going to be run in pretty much exactly the same way that the first exam would be. It's on grade scope. Uh, you'll have access to it for 24 hours. Uh, you've got two hours to take it unless you have accommodations for an extension. Uh, it's going to be multiple choice, uh, roughly the same number of multiple choice questions. There might be a few more. There might be a few less. I haven't finished compiling it all, but it'll be in that same range. Um, and just like before, you can go forwards and backwards. Uh, it's open book and open notes. So everything that was true of the first exam will be true of the second exam. Uh, and 
Um, in the meantime, uh, if you've got questions about any of this stuff, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, and I will hopefully be back uh, to do live lectures next uh, week after the exam. Take care, everyone.